We are wrapping up a series called Savvy Faith, where we are learning how to share our faith in a culture where it can be often difficult and where Christians oftentimes, I think, have dropped the ball. Uh, this morning is going to be a little bit different because we're not going to be primarily in one text. We're going to be uh, sort of scattershotting like a shotgun through the book of John. But if you have to go somewhere for your Bible comfort food or if you have to scroll in your app somewhere, John 14, verses 1 to 6, is the place to be because today's message... I am not going to try and make people mad, okay? This is not what I'm trying to do. But I am going to let you know that um, there is no message topic that I've preached that has been met with more hostility in the last 10 or so years than talking about world religions and specifically the exclusivity of Jesus. Um, So we're going to pray and we're going to jump into this topic, Is Jesus the Only Way? Uh, Father, I thank you for your word Lord, I I thank you for who you are and who you've revealed yourself to be in the word. God, I pray that this morning you would help us all to put on our critical thinking skills. Lord, I pray that this morning people that are here at this service would have um, amazing questions that maybe they've been longing to ask and have never had answered. I pray that they would be asked today. And, And Lord, I pray that your truth above all would reign supreme. And God, I know that that arguments can be had and, and logic and reason can, can be put out. But at the end of the day, it's about you changing our hearts and lives. At the end of the day, God, it's about you loving us, weary, broken people that you bring into your family forever. So I ask that your grace would settle on this place and that we would have a sense of your spirit with this topic that is so important for us today. In Jesus' name, all God's kids said, Amen. So today we're looking at world religions. There are so many. How can uh, just one be true? Uh, This is a a debate that is everywhere. Um, The philosophers, the psychologists, the barologists, people want to talk about this question. And if at any time during the service you have a question, you can text it in to that number right there, and we will do a little bit of a live Q&A at the end of the service when we're passing around the offering. Um, And this is your opportunity to ask any question you would like and it's, I know that some of you, because I don't have all, like, everyone's numbers in my Google account, so I know that some of you take this as your opportunity to send me jokes. I'm okay with that. So uh, I, I need to, so before we get into world religions, I need to give you a little history of where this started for me. Um, I, I chased a girl to youth group. I was raised in a non-Christian home. My idea of God was really built on cartoons. God and, and Satan uh, boxing was the visual that I had when I was a kid. God was an old bearded man and Satan was what you would expect, a pitchfork guy. So as a child, I had this cartoon thing and it was like the shoulder angel, the shoulder devil. That was all my concept of God. And then I went to a youth group because I saw a girl in my uh, choir class. Yes, I was in choir. Fear not. And, um, and in choir, I, I was like, oh, I like this girl. And my friend said, hey, I know where she hangs out on Wednesday nights. This is like how Christians do the bait and switch. Like some of you like land here because someone's like, hey, do you want to get coffee with me on Sunday morning? And they drag you to church. Um, don't be friends with those people, okay? Um, I, so, so my friend said on Wednesday nights, I know where she's at. You know, she's at my youth group. I'm like, I can't go to your youth group. And he said, no, just come. It's not like what you think. And um, so I went. And I saw um, the girl was there at the very introduction. And then the pastor gave this little message. And he told me about this guy named Jesus who died for me. And I had never heard it just clearly put out. He was trying to convince the youth group that they were sinners because church kids don't realize oftentimes how much they sin. My, my wife is a PK. There's this immunity that we give to children back there where we, we kind of just say, you know, don't lie, don't murder. And they grow up thinking, like, oh, I haven't lied and murdered anybody. I must be okay. No, the answer is you're not okay. You need Jesus. So the pastor was trying to convince all the Christian kids you guys are sinners. You're sinners. You've done this. And I was sitting there for the first 15 minutes thinking, dude, I know I'm a sinner. I need the answer. And then it came. And I went up to the pastor afterwards and I said, hey, why would I believe this and not the religions of my friends? Because at the time I had a core group of friends and one of them was um, from a Muslim family. One of them was from a Jehovah's Witness family and one of them was from a Mormon family. And we hung together all the time. We skated together. It was what we did. And he did the most amazing thing. He said, I want you to do this, Ryan. I want you to go to your friends And I want you to ask them questions. Who is God? How do we get to be in eternal life forever with him? What are the requirements of being saved? And then go visit them. And while you're doing that, I want you to read a couple books of the Bible. I want you to read one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. So I started in Matthew. And I want you to read a book called Romans. 
So that week I went home and I was just tearing through the Bible. I was amazed at all these stories about Jesus stealing kids' lunchboxes and feeding people, Jesus walking on. Why? It was just incredible. And then I, I arranged these meetings with my friends. So I went to my Mormon friend and I said, dude, um, I'm getting into this religion thing, I think. Um, where can I learn about your religion? And he said, oh man, uh, we meet before school. This was in high school. We meet before school at 6 a.m. We call this thing seminary that we do. And I was like, dude, that is not the Lord's religion. That is way too early. Um, but I went, and I sang the songs on their piano, and I got, they gave me a free book of Mormon. Since then, I've got like tons of them, because every time they offer them, I just take them, because I need firewood. And, um, and no, and that's mean. That's, that's mean, you guys. Uh, don't do that. That's jerk. Um, I'm, God's working on me. Okay, so, so I went there, though, and I asked some questions. Who is God? How do I get saved? And why, who is Joe Smith? What is this thing? Do I get gold like him? I want tablets. And all of these things about Mormonism. And then I went to my um, Muslim friend's house. I didn't go to a, a mosque, but I went to his house, and I asked his parents, who I had talked to a hundred times. I just said, hey, tell me about this guy. Like, who is Muhammad? How does Jesus fit into this? Because I'm reading about Jesus. Dude is incredible. Is Muhammad that cool? Like, what's going on? And then I went to my Jehovah's Witness uh, uh, Kingdom Hall, and I asked them all these questions. Who is God? How do you get saved? What does it mean to be a follower of your religion? And as I'm doing this, I'm reading through the Bible, and, uh, and I think, okay, God, I've, I've done a little spread shot of the religions that I'm connected to. I think I'm going to pick the Bible one because it seems reasonable, and you seem like a cool guy. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing for you now. And I went back to the youth pastor. I said, hey, so I told God, like, I'm on Team Jesus uh, what do I do next? Uh, how do I, like, become a follower of Jesus? Like, I, I did all the things. Like, I told, I said out loud, I believe in him. I confess with my mouth. God raised him from the dead. And the youth pastor was like, I think you saved yourself. I was like, no, 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 no. I read in the Bible, Jesus <laughs> saves me. I can't save myself. And, uh, and, and this is my start. Okay, this is how we started. And so now I've, I've been fascinated with religions ever since. Especially since, I'm just going to read through some statistics here, approximately 2.2 billion people uh, hold the name of Christian. This includes Catholic, Orthodox, and the Protestant umbrellas. 1.6 to 7 billion people uh, are adherents to Islam, and their holy book is the Quran. We don't need to, you guys know them because we're in the news. We talk about Muslims often. Hinduism, 1.1 billion people. They look to the Vedas, Vedangas, Upanishads, and Puranas. Buddhism is 1 billion, give or take. Uh, they really press into the noble truths. Buddhism is the biggest offshoot from Hinduism. Um, Chinese folk religions, hundreds of millions. Shinto, tens of millions. Sikhism, tens of millions. Judaism, 14 to 18 million. And then there's another survey that suggests that 36% of the population is non-religious, although half of those non-religious people believe in a deity. So I, I ask myself the question now, because this comes up all the time. Why are there so many religions, and why are there so many people who just say maybe they're all true, or maybe none of them are true? And I think part of it has come because of this technological flood that we've had with the internet. We have Wikipedia, and we Google things, and we just think, well, it's, we can't know. There's too much information. I think this overload of information has caused people, smart people, brilliant people, to just give up on this topic entirely. Now, there's an underlying truth, though, that um, an underlying notion that, not, that there's no truth that can be settled upon in religion. There's this idea that um, you can search for God, but don't ever claim that you found God. And if you don't believe me, go to a bookstore. Um, if you don't know what a bookstore is, there's these buildings that have shelves with paper things that you can read, okay? Um, I just bought a book for someone. David, I bought you a book. It's over here. I don't buy books very often at all. I buy these Kindle versions. So when I get the real book in my hand, I thought, David, I'm giving this guy a huge book to read, but you're a nerd like me, so we'll get along well with that book because I'm used to these Kindle books. But this information is just flooding our minds, and it's causing us to just question everything, the notion of what is true. And you can search for God. And if you go to the religious spirituality section, you'll find searching for God, looking for God, on the path for God. And that's okay. But in our culture, as soon as you say, I found God, I found a conclusion, instantly you become intolerant and bigoted and narrow-minded. It's okay to search. Just don't ever say that you found anything. And this is true. If you go to, to look at the best-selling books of spirituality, but before we uh, dig into this concept. I need to run through some scriptures. I'm going to put this down here. If, if you don't like Bibles on the ground, don't, don't judge me. It's just a little thing because I broke the, the pulpit that I have back there. So, okay. Are you guys ready? We're going to fly. Are you guys ready to fly? So right now, I need you to imagine this. Um, 
There's two ways to listen to Bible verses. One is to walk into the forest and look at the details of the trees, reach up and grab the orange, taste the orange, and it's juicy and delicious. That's what we call like in-depth study. This is not that. This is going to be flying over at Mach 2 of the, or of the grove of God's word, and I'm going to go down low enough, just stick your head out the window and try to bite an orange off a tree, okay? So that's what this is. That, we're, that, we're going fast. Uh, very popular verse, John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We know this verse, right? End zone verse. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. There's verse 18. But whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Now, very popular John 3.16. You don't see people getting tattoos of John 3.18 on their upper back. So who is the son of God? And what does he have to say for himself? If you read the Gospel of John this week, it's, it's probably my second favorite of the four Gospels. Um, it only takes you two and a half hours at conversation speed if you can just keep going and turn your ADD off, okay? If you, if you can do that, two and a half hours, you can read the whole book. But we're going to go through a ton of them right now. This is who the Son of God says he is. This is who Jesus said he is. John 6, 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus literally said, I am bread. I love that God created us to need food to sustain ourselves. If we don't eat food, we die. And some of you have experienced that. Although it's getting rarer and rarer, um, there are those days where we have hunger pains. And I, I feel those days, I've been doing this thing, um, intermittent fasting, where like I'll stop eating at 5 p.m., and then I'm just, I go all night just thinking about Twinkies and donuts, and I wake up in the morning, and I just drink water to try to simulate fullness, and then I drink coffee, and it's miserable. And by the end of it, my body says, if you don't feed me, I'll kill you, and it's not lying. And then I eat, and it's joyous. It's I know I hate that I do this to you guys so often, but it's like when you get um, that fresh baked anything right out of the oven, and as soon as you smell it, your body gets excited with anticipation that you're about to devour fresh baked bread slash brownies slash whatever else is in there, and then you, you salivate for it, and then you eat it, and then you eat way more than you should, and then you sit and watch Netflix and just rub your tummy like a conqueror. I'm the, am I the only one? Okay, I'm the only one. Um, but... <laughs> But I like that God wired this into the world. And then Jesus comes and says, you know how you need bread? You know how you need food to live physically? I am the equivalent of that spiritually. If you don't take me into your life, you die. And if you don't have a constant flow of me, you have hunger pains. You get hangry. This is what happens if you don't receive Jesus as the living bread. And then John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the bread and he is the light. In the light, darkness scatters. In my um, high school days, after I became an honorary Christian, before Jesus shaved some edges off of me, my friend and I, Josh, Josh Dixon, we were, the, we were the holy rollers of our group of friends after I got accepted into the Christian group. And we used to have these New Year's Eve parties. And this was back when like Will Smith was doing um, getting jiggy with it and what, Will 2K. So just, I'm putting that in your mind. So they would have these parties, New Year's Eve, everyone's dancing. Mm. And these are Christians, dancing like they should. This was before twerking, so there wasn't that bad of dancing. But, um, but they're going dancing. They're just doing it. And my friend Josh and I, like, people are sinning. You know what we should do? Middle of the party, just turn on all the lights. So we would, he'd go to that light switch. I'd go to this light switch. And we'd just be like, boom. And you have never seen high schoolers act like cockroaches, like when lights come on in the middle of a dance party where you know sin is happening in the minds of people. They just scattered. And Jesus is the light that will scatter darkness. And if you follow him, you won't walk in darkness. This is why when you're walking somewhere at night and you have the headlamp, people stand behind you and in your wake. People don't go just in front of you out into the darkness. They want to see where they're going. Jesus is the spiritual light of the world. John 8, 58, Jesus says, Before Abraham was, I am. Now this is the key passage to all of the I am statements in the book of John. Because Jesus was claiming something here that nobody had ever claimed and nobody ever will claim again, at least be able to claim truthfully. Jesus was talking with the religious people, the pastors and priests of his day, and, and they were saying, you're not even 50 years old. How can you claim all of these things? And he says, before Abraham was, now Abraham lived thousands of years before him, Jesus said, I am. And he's trying to point the Jewish people back to a story, back to the story of Exodus in the burning bush when Moses said, tell me, 
Who, who do I tell Pharaoh sent me? And God said, tell them the I am sent you. I am that I am. Jesus was claiming to be that voice, that presence, that deity, that God from that bush. And sometimes, I, I know that Jesus didn't sin, but sometimes I wonder, like, if he made faces, if he smirked at people. Because any time that I can catch someone off guard and, and really, like, just change their perspective, I love it. But I always smirk when I do it. I, like, drop a truth bomb, and I'm like, uh-huh. I always wonder if this was one of Joe's moments for Jesus. If he, if he was getting badgered by the pastors and priests, and he was... He was just getting to the point where he's like, oh, these guys just don't get it. They just don't get it. Yeah, I'm just going to drop the ultimate bomb. I'm going I'm to tell them that I was the dude in the burning bush before Abraham was. I am. And then just walks away. That's the mic drop moment. That's like the Obama end of the State of the Union mic drop moment. Just finishes the conversation. And this is why he was killed, because he was claiming to be God. John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He is the door. He is not a door. He is not one of many doors. Jesus said of himself, I am the door. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. John 15, 1, if you need these later, I can email them to you. You just send the text up there, say email to this address. I'll email all these verses to you. I am the true vine. Abide in me and I in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus is saying, I'm what you got to eat. I am what you got to use to see. I am the way in. I am the shepherd who cares. I am the door. I am that I am. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, There's only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Colossians 1.19 says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or on earth, making peace by the blood. Acts 4.12 says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And John 14, 6, from the mouth of Jesus, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Whew. Okay, we could land the plane. Now you might be thinking, that sounds exclusive. You're making it sound like Jesus said that he is the only way. Just so we're clear, I'm not making it sound like anything. Jesus is making it sound that way just fine on his own. He is definitely saying that he is the way to be in relationship with the eternal God. So you might be asking questions in your brain right now. What about the people who have never heard about Jesus? What about the person, uh, the monk that's in Tibet? What about someone born in the 1100 ADs in Mongolia? What about someone uh, who isn't even born yet? You can text those questions in if you want. And I, I likely don't have answers for every situation that you could text and that could be brought up today. But if you want to take me to lunch, your treat, I will answer as many questions as you have. And I have a lot of answers only because I'm a nerd. I, I need you to know, though, that I, I don't like giving out all of the answers because I've seen this tendency within Western Christianity that when you get the answers from somebody else, whether it's a YouTube video or a book that you read or a pastor answering your questions, when you get these answers, what tends to happen is that we get proud that we have the right doctrine, we're on the right team, we're part of the right tribe. And pride is not ever, ever a desirable outcome for followers of Jesus. We get nudged toward pride when our answers seem more reasonable than the answers of another religion, and I am so guilty of this. But we need to ask ourselves, according to these passages, what does Scripture teach us about Jesus? What does Scripture teach us about how we can get to heaven? And the answer seems very clear. C.S. Lewis famously put, um, if you read the Bible, you have, to, you have to put Jesus in one of three categories. He's either a liar, what he said is not true, or he's a lunatic, he was out of his mind because he was claiming things that no one should be able to claim, or he is Lord, liar, lunatic, Lord. He can't just be a good teacher. He can't just be someone with good principles because if he's a good teacher, then you have to listen to what he taught. And he taught that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, are, are devout people from other faiths not accepted into the family of God? So my question would be, does devotion equal truth? And this leads to a story. I bought a new phone at Verizon once. This was back when I was with Verizon before um, I decided that I liked getting my calls dropped and I switched to T-Mobile, okay? So I got my gadget and I came out of the store and uh, my wife was with me and, and we see two young men walking over 
um, slacks, white shirt, thin tie, and they were like 18, and they had the name Elder. So I'm like, yes, they're coming. Um, and part of me said, just run away, run away, because I had had this pet thing of like, I love to talk to people from other religions and try to convert them to Christianity. But I did it more with a bludgeon than with the grace of God at that time. And they came up, and, and as they're walking up, um, they don't know me, but, but, and I don't know them personally, but I had purchased the Mormon missionary training manual my senior year of high school, and I had devoured it. I loved it. I knew the lines that they were going to say, and they're walking up, and you just see my wife go, oh, no. And then I'm there just like Mr. Smithers, yes, Lord. And they come up, and they say, hey, how's it going? I'm like, great. And they say, have you ever heard of Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? As a matter of fact, I have. Read all your books. And then you could see um, there's two characters here. One was the aggressor. The other one was the guy who, when I said I read all your books, said, uh-oh. <laughs> and, um, and then we proceeded to talk because they were devout followers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And this is bad Ryan. This is young Ryan, whose Bible said Tyrone was thumper. This was me trying to dominate. Um, but, it, but it proves the point because I, I still use these same arguments just with more love and grace and kindness. Um, I, they, they started explaining. I said, oh, I know about your religion. You know, I'm a follower of Jesus, just a different Jesus. And they said, oh, no, we follow the same Jesus. I'm like, actually, your religion started because you said my Jesus was the wrong Jesus, and that's why the Mormon church started. And then it started to go downhill. And then well, I asked, he said, how do you know what you believe is true? And I said, well, I have faith, and it's a reasonable faith. I, I've got reasons based on scripture, evidence of the resurrection, et cetera. He went through some of those things. And I said, how do you know you, your faith is true? And the, the aggressor young man said, well, um, I prayed to God, and he gave me a burning in my bosom. And this, I said, dude, you are 18. You should never use the word bosom, ever. Um, this is not a thing that you should do. And I said, just because you believe something and get a burning doesn't make it true. That, that makes it actually something that could be very bad and you need a doctor for. But some of you got that, you sinners. <laughs> you sinners. Some of you all like, oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, and he said, well, I believe, and that makes it true. It's, it's true for me. And I said, wait, I want you to do something for me. And at this point, I felt his blood pressure rising. I, sh rising. I should have stopped. And I said, I want you to close your eyes. In the middle of a parking lot, like a six foot six man telling you to close your eyes. And I got a voice like Marlon Brando and, and Morgan Freeman infused. Yeah, I'm like, close your eyes, son. You know? And uh, he did. And I was like, yes. Like, no, I didn't. Um, he closed, I said, close your eyes. I want you to believe. I want you to believe with all of your heart and might. I want you to just rest up the belief that I am a 400 pound sumo warrior. Just believe it. And his friend, the, the quiet one, starts snickering. <laughs> and you see this kid just like squint. The blood leaves his eyelids because he's squinting so hard. And I, I said, dude, you can open your eyes. I'm not going to turn into a 400-pound sumo warrior just because you believe it. You can't believe that I'm going to be a two-foot pygmy warrior or a 400-pound sumo warrior. Belief doesn't make something true. There, there has to be a capital T truth in this world, a absolute truth. There's something that is true, and if it's true, your belief and your feelings will not change it. <clears throat> the conversation escalated poorly from there. It ended with them walking off one direction, um, yelling things at me like, you're going to go to hell. And I'm like, you don't even believe in eternal hell. And um, it was bad. <clears throat> so uh, I want us to think about this, though, because there is this assault on the idea of truth. There's this assault on the idea of absolute truth. What's true for you is true for you, what's true for me is true for me. That's what people say all the time. And my question is, is that a true statement or a false one? There's this relativistic thinking that basically says, keep your truths to yourself and let me believe whatever I want to believe because I will make it true by my ascension to that idea. So I want to think about this. Could all religions, first off, equally be true or partially true? I think there are good aspects and components of, of all religions because we are created in the image of God. And that image of God bleeds out into other religions, like loving others. But the phrases I hear is, are like these. You shouldn't judge people from other religions, Ryan. Maybe Christianity is true for you, but it's not true for me, so don't push your beliefs on me. To which I usually reply, if I'm feeling comfortable, by you telling me not to push my beliefs on you, you're taking your belief of secular humanism and telling me that I have to believe that. But my God says I'm supposed to share the good news. And your God, who is your brain and intellect, says I'm supposed to only obey you. That would make you my God, and I don't want to do that. 
So could they be true? There's this famous Indian parable, uh, and it goes like this. And this is used to explain that all religions are, are partially true, maybe. Uh, there's blind men that approach an elephant. And as they approach, they're at different parts of the elephant. And they're blind, so they can't see. So the first man is, is there, and the elephant represents religion in this parable. And the first man says, well, the, the elephant's like this. It's, it's kind of wiggly, and it's, it's shooting water at me, and it's long, and it grabbed my arm. And the second blind man says, no, no, because he's by the leg. He says, no, this, this thing that we're near, it's, it's like a tree. It is strong. I can't even move it. And the third blind man says, no, 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 it's, it's not a tree or a, a snake-like thing. It's, a, it's like a wall or a brick covered in some sort of fabric. And then there's the poor guy in the back. He says, you guys are all wrong. There's a little tuft of hair, and it's humid and windy back here. Just seeing if you're there. Okay. No, I mean, that's, I made that last one totally up. But, but you get the point. And then the parable goes on to say, see, this is what religion is like. Every faith has part of the truth that they, that they are embracing and encountering. Now, this sounds so nice. It, it sounds uh, nice, just like the Baha'i version of this story, which is the mountain and all the paths lead up. Christianity is a path. Muslim, Islam is a path. Jehovah's Witnesses is a path. They're all a path. Hinduism, Buddhism. But the same problem comes with both of these. Is that while they are saying that we are being arrogant for being exclusive and saying Jesus is the only way, if you think about this story, both of these stories, you have to understand what they're doing. They're putting themselves in the most arrogant position of all because the person telling the story is the one person claiming that they are not blind and that they can see the whole elephant. And they're watching those religious people fondle around the elephant trying to figure out what it's like. But they have the all-seeing eye of understanding. The same with the mountain illustration from the Baha'i faith. They say that all paths lead up, but they're in the most arrogant position of all because they're already saying that I'm at the top of the mountain and I see all the paths from my vantage point. So while trying to combat the arrogance that is often seen in Christians and adherence to religions, they're actually putting themselves in the most arrogant position of all. So, is Jesus the only way? Could they all be true? I don't think so. Could they all be equally invalid? I'm going to broaden this. Could all views of spiritual ultimate truth, capital T truth, could they all be invalid? Now, it's, it's intellectually stimulating for me to pursue hundreds of trails because I don't get to geek out up here very often. Usually, it's more like passion and in the text, but I, I love being a nerd every once and again. So I want to give you guys some things that I hear often. People say, uh, in the argument that religion is not needed, it's just a crutch for weak people. And I used to get really mad at that. It's not a crutch. I'm strong. But then I sang Amazing Grace enough times, and I blew it enough times in my life to where I realized, actually, Christianity is not a crutch. Christianity is more like a hospital bed with a defibrillator because I'm, I was dead in need of life. I wasn't weak in need of a cane or a crutch or a wheelchair. Jesus had to come in and give me life because I was spiritually dead. Some people, the philosopher types, they might quote something like Wikipedia at you. My favorite, slash by favorite, I mean least favorite person that I enjoy encountering um, when I go to coffee shops or bars to hang out, um, inevitably, it's just a matter of weeks before I meet somebody who is like a philosophy student, freshman in college. And, um, and I love them to death. They're like puppies that you get on Christmas Eve. They're just so cute until they yap and they Go to the bathroom all over your living room, okay? And, um, and eventually they'll say, well, you know, they quote like the big philosophers. They're never quoting like the obscure ones because they're in, uh, they're in philosophy 101. So they'll say, Nietzsche said that all truth claims are just power grabs. And I'll say, isn't that, is that a true claim? Because are you trying to grab power from me now? It has a nice sentiment and it pushes back against history of abusive religion. And Believe me, Christianity has had its fair share of ridiculousness. But Jesus pushed back against religious people. Jesus pushed back against the religious people during his day who created a system instead of bringing people into relationship with God. But we have to know, and we have to get that ear to understand when people make these claims, like, oh, I don't believe in, a, in such a thing as truth or spiritual truth, they are making a truth claim statement. Or maybe the psychologist Freud, my dude Freud, I love this guy. He says that all views of God are really just psychological projections to deal with our guilt and insecurity. Okay, so process this. All views of God are just psychological projections to deal with guilt and insecurity. I'll tell you one thing that Freud knew and understood, that humans are guilty and that we are insecure. And he saw our desire to go to God as a way to cope with guilt and insecurity. Now, I don't know about you, but my experience in many, many religions 
is not the fact that they deal with guilt. My experience with many religions, including Christianity, including here it can happen, is that we are guilt and shame factories. If you want to find out how a church approaches shame and guilt, just confess a sin to somebody. And I don't mean like a little sin. I mean go big or go home. Just lay it out there and see the face that they make. See if they say, oh, you haven't been reading your Bible and praying enough. It's like they think God is a genie. And if we pray enough, we can rub them out of the lamp. This is what, even in Christianity, we believe. Freud, although he is attempting to give us an idea and a construct to see religion through, interestingly enough, he is basically doing what Adam and Eve did. He's putting himself in the place of God. He's saying, I don't need God to deal with my guilt and insecurity. Instead, I'm going to deal with it on my own. I'm going to look at my nature and nurture. I'm going to look at how I was raised. I was going to look at what, what my parents did. I'm going to look at all of these things about my, my inner conscience. Conscious. He is, in saying that all views of God are psychological projections, my question would be, isn't your view of a non-God a psychological projection? It's always so much fun to just turn them around on their head like a rabbi. Or my favorite, not from the not from the uh, philosopher, not from the psychologist or the sociologist, but from the barologist. You're only a Christian because you were born in this country. You'd be a Muslim if you were born in a Muslim country, to which I usually reply, well, I wasn't born biologically into a Christian family. However, if I'm feeling um, particularly zesty that day, if I've had more than seven cups of coffee, which is my par for the course these days, I will say something like, well, you're only a secular humanist because you were born in... 1983 in the United States of America. If you were born in another country, you wouldn't be a secular humanist and believe these things that you believe. As a matter of fact, if you want to go preach your beliefs about coexist bumper stickers, go do it in a radical Muslim country and let me know how far you get down the street. <laughs> because I still like you. And some of them won't. It's not to say that some Christians won't be totally foolish. I mean, those coexist stickers, they do, they do get me going. It was more prevalent in California when I was there. Um, it's the land of Priuses and coexist stickers, uh, which I kind of like because it's quiet and it's kind of nice-ish. Here it's the land of, like, pickup trucks, and I don't know if you're carrying a gun, so I can't do anything if you cut me off. <laughs> but with all of this, I would encourage you to begin to see that everybody is exclusive. Everybody makes a claim of some form of ultimate spiritual truth, whether they recognize it or not. The real question is, whose exclusive views will lead to the better humanity, will lead to peace and truth on this earth? Whose views will lead to people who are marked by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? And I believe there's only one answer, obviously, because I have this job. And here's, here's why. The one thing that differs Christianity from Every religion, bar none, I have not found another religion that does this, is that A, the leader of our religion was perfect. He claimed to be perfect. His followers said he was perfect. No other leader of any religion ever claims that. Uh, Muhammad said that he was a man just like all the other men. Uh, Buddha was a Sidd Siddhartha. Gautama was a man who offshoot, offshoot shot from Hinduism, and he had two different lives that he lived. Um, every other religion, Confucianism, Joseph Smith put his head into the, the dark room to read these tablets and had 27 wives ranging from very, very young to his age. Jesus was the only one that history records that everyone around him, even his enemies, Pontius Pilate said, in this man I find no guilt. And then two, Christianity, biblical Christianity, is all of grace. Because if it was all about being right, then we would do what I've said that Christians have often done. We stand by the cross and say, come be like me, we've got all the answers. And we do have a lot of answers, but that's not the point of Christianity. Christianity is not this prideful stance of saying, we are on team correct. Christianity is one of total grace, where God looks down and says, there's a wretch, there's a wretch, there's a wretch, there's a wretch, everywhere a wretch, wretch. And I'm going to love them. I'm going to give my son for them. I'm going to clean them, and I'm going to give them spiritual bread and spiritual light, and I'm going to bring them to the cross. In a it's my total free gift, and we bow down and we say, there's more room, everybody. Come on, there's more room. 
If you're wretched like me, there's more room. The cross of Christ is not a place for people with all of the right answers. It's a place for people on whom God has poured his love. And we have said, God, I bring nothing and you give me everything. Thank you. This is the grace of God. This is what differentiates Christianity. Because every other religion says, if you do X, Y, and Z, then you will get to this place. God said, you will never measure up. So guess what? I'm going to do it for you and put that spirit in you. So now that you have this amazing ability to walk with the divine cosmic unity to me that you were created for. Every other religion, and unfortunately many within Christianity, will heap condemnation and shame and use fear and guilt to manipulate your behavior, to get you to give more, to get you to serve more, to get you to, to do these things, because if you don't, then God will smite you or, or take things from you. Christianity is the one religion where today, if you believe in Jesus, if you walked in these doors saying, I love God, I'm all about God, he said, it's finished. You are mine. Nothing can shake you from my hands. I pray that that would be you today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to explore this topic. And Lord, it's, um, it's never enough time to do this justice. Um, Lord, I apologize if, if my humor offended people. But God, I don't apologize if your word offended them. God, you are supreme and over all things. You stand alone on the mountain of God. And you have made a way for us to freely come and be freely accepted with no pretense of having to clean up our act in order for us to be loved by you. Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I pray that now those who are thinking and pondering these questions, that they would wrestle with them honestly and that they wouldn't seek pat answers or cliches but they would press in to know truth, capital T, ultimate truth. Lord, I love you. It's all for you. In Jesus' name, amen.